The next one in line will take us to how we actually do the testing. Because there is actually new information in this slide. This part was sort of, uh, okay, this is just a name. This is, I didn't mention that one actually. I, I mentioned this one. How are we going to compare? That's the thing now. How are we actually going to compare the two pieces of information? The treatment sum of squares and the error sum of squares. It was 30 point something and it was 5 something in our example. How are we going to compare these two numbers? Well, here it comes. First of all, let me just... Let's, let's look at this one. It, it's actually written in the table also here, and now I put it again uh, explicitly here. The way we're going to do it is like this. In fact, sometimes the name of the numerator, in the numerator, we take the sum of squares for treatment, and we divide by the number of groups minus 1. We divide by the number of groups. I realize I have used capital K, which is the same as small letter K here to, uh, today. And in our example, this is the number three, right? Um, we take this sum of squares of treatment and we divide it by number of groups minus one. We give that, sometimes we call that MS treatment. For mean square, sum of squares averaged by the number 3 minus 2. So it's a mean square. And in the numerator, we, th we then have MSE. These are names that you can find, and you also columns, actually, in the output of software, where you divide those sum of squares by what is then called K minus, K minus 1 would then be degrees of freedom. That's another terminology for treatment, and n minus k would be degrees of freedom for the error. And why do we use degrees of freedom? Well, that's because of the theory that comes on the next slide. The theory tells us, actually, if I may jump to the next slide, the theory tells us the following, and this is how we can do hypothesis testing in practice because of this theoretical result. The theory tells us that if we have constructed, and now after all this time, I, I came up with a final solution of how should I compare the group means with each other. I compare the three group means with each other by computing this statistic. I call it an F statistic. And the reason why it's called an F statistic, of course, as we have done throughout the course, is the fact that it follows an F distribution if there is no group difference at all, so right? If you could say, if the null hypothesis is true, I mean, this is standard hypothesis test thinking now and procedures. If the hypo hypothesis test is true, then we have that the computed F follows an F distribution. Which F distribution does it follow? There are many. We have met the F previously. We met the F back in chapter 8 when we compared two variances with each other, right? Uh, two, actually, two variance estimates. We divided them by each other, and then we used the F for doing this hypothesis test. Now we're going to use the F again for this hypothesis test. We're going to use the right F. The right F comes with K minus 1, number of degrees of freedom for the numerator, and n minus k degrees of freedom for the denominator. So that's the theoretical result that sample probability theory will give us. If we repeatedly computed an f like this, we have three groups, we do the experiment again, let us assume that there are no differences between groups, we are measuring sort of um, sort of how much plants are growing, whether they're listening to Mozart or Beethoven or Bach. We do this experiment. We have four plants uh, listening to Mozart, four plants listening to Beethoven, and four plants listening to Bach. 
And after a week, we measure how much uh, biological mass have we got out of these plants after a week of growth. That's a nice experiment you can do in your grow house. Um, or three different greenhouses. You need one with Bach and one with Beethoven and one with... Who was the last guy? Oh, the Mozart guy. Good. Thank you. Um, you do this experiment and you do it again. Computer and F, you do it again, and computer and F, and you do it again, and computer and F, you do it again, and computer and F, and you spent the summer doing that. Having done that, how will those F statistics, these F values that you have computed in your experiments, how will they look if you plot them in a histogram? Let's say you did it a hundred times, this experiment. If you plot them in a histogram, they will look like an F distribution. This particular F distribution. That's what the, but then this is the nice thing about probability theory. You don't have to spend the summer doing this experiment. Even, I have taught you two different ways of not having to do this experiment over the summer. Either rely on my word and use the probability theoretical result. This is the sampling distribution of this one is an F distribution. So that's why the F distribution is the correct one to use to measure whether the computed F is too large or not, right? That's the t classical thinking. Or you could use the computer to simulate. If you don't want to rely on probability theory, you can do uh, three lines of uh, implement implementing things in, in R, and you could check what I'm saying, whether that's true or not. You could do this experiment in R, the Mozart Bach Beethoven experiment. You could do that with three lines of code in R and see what comes out of it. Um, let's just dwell on why. Uh, let's have a look before I do that. Let's just, this is a, a well-known friend of ours that we met back, as I told you, in chapter 8. This is the example of how an F distribution looks like. When we use it for hypothesis testing here, Large values of the computed F are critical for the hypothesis. That is, the larger the treatment differences, the larger the F. And the only question is, is it too large or not? Or is it large enough to prove a group difference, or is it not? That's why we have a critical region above a certain number, and then we have an acceptance region below a certain number. The certain number depends on the degrees of freedom, and it depends on the level of alpha. We can find those critical values in tables 6, or we can find them by the R function. Often we use the 5% level. I wanted to dwell on... Apart from probability theory, there is actually a feature of this test statistic. I'll just spend a few minutes on that before we do the break. That makes it possible for us also to somehow understand why it gives very good sense, makes good sense to use this statistics. And why, on average, actually, if H0, H0, the null hypothesis, is true, then we sort of would expect f to be around 1. And if f becomes larger than 1, it becomes more and more critical for the hypothesis. Why is that? Well, I want to think about MS treatment. What is MS treatment? The one which is in the numerator. Let me write it in a different way for our example. In our example, it, it's four times sum i equal 1 to 3. It's y i bar minus y bar divided by 2. Have a look at this number. Can you say with other words, I mean, the, the, the four there, if I go back, just to remind you, on the defining formula, I have to jump back a few slides to share with you again the re defining formula for the SSTR. Here it was, the defining formula for SSTR. The four I took out is the NI, right? And then I run back.
Here I was. And then I, because I, and I, I don't look at the SSTR, I take the MSTR, the exact number which is in the numerator of the F. Can you put other words to this part? Can you recognize this? It's more or less something that I've said out already, said out loud. What is this number? It's a variance. And if we should be completely correct, if we sh should be more specific, it's the variance of what? Of the groups? Exactly. It's the variance of the group means, if I should be even more specifically, more exact. Uh, it's because I have three group means, y1 bar, y2 bar, y3 bar. At least, I mean, when the groups have the same number of observations. So, so this way of thinking is exact when ni is the same. And if it's not the same, we can still use it as, as a way of understanding things. It's the variance of the three group means, right? This one is the variance of the three group means. So you could say this also equals four. It also equals, let me put it in a different way. Generally, it, it equals ni times variance of group means as it was so correctly said. It's ni four times the variance of group means. Now, how much do we expect group means to vary if there is no difference between groups? This is a question I could put in an exam exercise for you. How much do we expect those group means to vary? We just have a, have a question. Should I, can I continue this part and then we take your question, okay? Um, uh, otherwise, I will forget my point here. Um, how much do we expect the variance of the group means, the group means to vary? That was my question. Well, this was what I taught you back in chapter 6 and 7, where I taught you that a variance of a mean the variance of a mean is the variance of the individuals divided by n so i expect means repeated means to vary like this and then when i multiply them by n i expect that this ms treatment more or less, we could say, if H not is true, that is, that there are really no differences between groups, I expect the MS treatment, because I multiply by N, I expect that to be around the variance. But this one down here, MSE, is also an estimate of the within group variability. So if the group, I'm sort of taking the expected variability of group means, following sample, the classical sample, uh, sampling variability result, I know how much they are allowed to vary from group to group, alone due to chance. That's the sample, uh, that's the result from previously. And then I relate it to my estimate of the within group variability. And if it goes way beyond one, the groups are really different. If it's not significantly larger than one, I cannot claim different, right? So there was just, I was just digging a little bit more into why this F statistic makes sense. You don't have to worry about it if you can live with it. But if you'd like to understand it, this was five minutes trying to make you understand it a bit more. The formal result is that probability tells us that it becomes an F distribution. But we can understand why it should be around one, alone using our knowledge. We can understand that this is a good measure that should be around one. If there is nothing going on, if there is something going on, it goes beyond one. This was the F statistic question from you. Can you explain why you divide by k minus one? This is the same thing, uh, this is the same question as why do you, in a computation of a variance, divide by n minus 1 and not by n. 
Uh, I tried to answer that partly back in uh, the first uh, lecture we had, that it has to do with the fact that when you compute a variance, what you should... So this is the same question I'm, I'm repeating. It, it's a good question. Uh, a variance, in a true variance, you should really put in... I mean, you should really compare observations with the true mean, right? And see how do observations deviate from the true mean. But since we don't know the true mean, we, we plug in our estimate, which is our average that we are plugging in, which means that we are already cheating a little bit, right? We are ch cheating in the sense that each of the individual observations will be closer to their own mean on average than they will be to the true mean. Because you cheat and you, you use themselves to compute the mean. The exact way of cheating corresponds to this one number that you don't divide by n, but by n minus 1. That's a rather detailed linear algebra result with dimensions of the linear subspaces to make the proof that the exact way of correcting for cheating is by dividing by n minus 1 instead of n. But I hope you can follow me that, it is that that's the reason why we have to not divide by n, but by n minus 1 generally when we compute a variance in that way. Was that okay? I hope we, I think we have to say it's okay now and uh, do a break, 15 minutes break, three over, we start again. <laughs>